Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Researcher Miller, and the SCP we're going to be studying today is SCP-965. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-965 is contained within a framed, ready-to-install window, henceforth referred to as SCP-965-1, composed of at least six panes of clear glass or similar material, measuring at least 15 by 30 centimeters. SCP-965-1 must in turn be kept within an environmentally controlled storage facility capable of withstanding significant seismic disturbances. SCP-965-1 should be inspected at least once per week to check for degradation of material. At all times, at least two similar framed windows must be present and within separate chambers in additional padding and insulation. No other window pane measuring greater than 14 cm wide or 29 cm tall between them and the current SCP-965-1. The lighting within the chamber containing SCP-965 must be at a minimal of 130 candelas at any time personnel are within said chamber, except during research. While SCP-965 is currently contained within SCP-965-1, our inability to control its movement upon destruction of SCP-965-1 through means beyond proximity have prompted its elevation to Euclid status. Research into a more permanent means to contain SCP-965 is ongoing, and individual experiments may be carried out by Clearance Level 1 personnel after approval by Level 3 administration. Description SCP-965 is a visual manifestation that occurs within framed windows. This manifestation takes the shape of a shadowed face of an apparently pale-skinned male that is looking through the window. The exact details shown vary, as does the direction of orientation as well as the age of the person. However, sufficient detail shows it to consistently be the same being at differing points in its life, between the approximate ages of 10 and 55. Research into an individual matching SCP-965 has thus far proven inconclusive. SCP-965 will only appear when the relative lighting on the outside of the window falls below five candles, regardless of lighting on the inside. Such terms are possible because the face will only appear in a fully assembled window frame, though it does not need to be currently installed. Thus far, SCP-965 has not shown any ability to intentionally move from one glass pane to another. Even within the same installation, it is only able to attain a new manifestation point upon the destruction of the current SCP-965-1, at which point its new habitat will be reclassified as SCP-965-1. The face is visible from the outside portion of SCP-965-1, but despite its two-dimensional nature, it is described as looking away into the room. Initial effects caused by SCP-965 are reports of unease, nervousness, and low-grade paranoia. These sensations will overcome anyone within visual range of the manifestation, even if obscured, such as by curtains. Based upon reports pertaining to residents of the house where SCP-965 was discovered, encountered problems sleeping. Experiments were conducted using D-Class personnel, who were made to sleep in a chamber where SCP-965-1 was installed. An individual that is sleeping in any area visible to SCP-965 when it manifests will invariably have dreams of a disturbing nature, usually involving being chased, attacked, tormented, etc., though without physical contact within the dream. With repeated incidents involving the same subject, as few as three, but never more than ten, dream cycles before onset, SCP-965 will begin manifesting with a more explicit smile than normal. After this point, the subject will begin complaining of heartburn or abdominal pain, and often begin to vomit blood or have blood and bodily wastes. This is caused by the victim suffering ulcers and low-grade hemorrhaging throughout varied locations in their gastrointestinal tract. The current hypothesis as to the cause of these afflictions is SCP-965's influence artificially accelerating the body's reactions to elevated stress and fear levels. 
Subjects who advance to this stage have also reported continuing experiences of the facial manifestations in windows during dreams, as well as in peripheral vision while awake. Even after being removed from the vicinity of SCP-965, most suffer from low-grade but lasting feelings of paranoia, as well as sensations that they are being watched or followed. Whether this is in fact some remnant influence left behind, or standard symptoms of the stress followed by the traumatic intrusion of SCP-965 into their psyche is under investigation. SCP-965 has produced no noise to date, and there have been no reported instances of SCP-965 animating in any way once it appears. However, it is capable of disappearing and reappearing at will in different poses. SCP-965 also shows signs of sentience. It has been observed to show disappointment if it manifests to an empty room, irritation or anger when manifesting before someone that had broken a prior SCP-965-1, and one instance of visible fear when in the presence of Agent who had earlier participated in its retrieval. Addendum Incident 965-1 On 19 Routine testing involving the destruction of SCP-965-1 confirmed that while a multi-paned window may act as multiple holding zones, sufficient damage to the overall structure disqualifies it as a possible replacement. Unfortunately, SCP-965 instead manifested in an adjacent experimentation chamber's observational window. Due to the high standards of Foundation equipment, this required the window's complete removal and destruction via tactical breaching charge. SCP-965 was viewed with significantly hostile expressions for one month after the incident. Addendum Incident 965-2 On 20 Doctor requested transfer away from the project involving SCP-965. She was reported as beginning to have visions of SCP-965 and to experience feelings of paranoia, similar to those affected during sleep, despite not having slept in the presence of SCP-965 herself. Dr. was temporarily relieved of duties and assigned to psychological care. No other instances of SCP-965 affecting personnel who have not slept in its presence have been reported. Okay, that about does it for today. Thank you all for listening, and you are all dismissed. Goodbye. I would like to give a special thank you to André Bichert, Desmond Haskins, and Getzeberry. Thank you all very much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. If you would like a special thank you at the end of each of my videos, and some other cool stuff as well, go to patreon.com forward slash the Vulcan. Thank you. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to let everybody know that I am now selling merch. I have about 12 designs up right now, all I've worked pretty hard on. My logo in several different styles is one of them, but I've also done logos for the Shark Punching Center, a spicy crust pizzeria, some original designs, some of which based on 049682. I have the Mobile Task Force Nine Tailed Fox logo. I was a graphic designer before I started trying to do this for a living, so I have a pretty good skill set when it comes to making original designs. I don't make very much from it at all by any means, I'm not getting rich of it. But if you'd like to support my channel on a one time basis, maybe Patreon is too much of a commitment for you. Get a t-shirt, or a hoodie, or a phone case, or something like that. Redbubble is pretty good for that kind of thing. Anyway, I've shilled enough for this video. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll see you all soon. Bye bye